Support for this show, Politics and Right, comes from politicsandright.com, publishers of How to Make America Utopia, Take Away the Economy from Those Who Rigged It, As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom. It's worth it, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors, and other books written by Egberto Willis. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O. Support for this show and Politics and Right comes from politicsandright.com. That is publishers of Egberto How to Make America Willis. Utopia, Take Let Away the engage. Economy from Those Who Rigged It. Politics As I see it, right. class warfare, the only resort to right-wing doom. It's worth it. How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors, and Other Books Written by Egberto Willis. Welcome to Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Good morning, Houston. Good morning, Harris County. Good morning to the great state of Texas. Good morning to Northeast Texas, Southeast Texas, Southwest Louisiana, Northwest Louisiana, and all the nooks and crannies receiving the signals from our 100,000 watt uh, transmitter into those magical boxes known as uh, Howard Machines, uh, a.k.a. Radios. Anyhow, folks, we're going to have a great show for you today. Welcome aboard to our international listeners, watchers, however you consume more programs via the internet, formerly known as ARPANET, created by whom? We the people, created by you, your intellect, your work, your worth. Folks, we have to get back to where it's all done. It's not, it's all about you. Not about the few. Anyway, before we get busy, let's go to the studio, to the geniuses that keeps the tin cans and the wires and all these things working perfectly, at least 99.9% of the times. That is true. Uh, tin cans and uh, dental floss is what we use. We've upgraded. <laughs> you get more frequencies <laughs> with dental floss than you do a regular stream. It's like I AM radio. So. Compared to FM radio. Is that unwaxed or waxed? Oh, I don't know. It just <laughs> works, man. That's all I care about. I was over here sleeping in my cranny when I heard my name. So here I am. And well, back yeah. in the sun. Got something exciting going on today. Ronnie and Tom, the R&R show, will be coming to you live from Christian's tailgate from 1 to 3 this afternoon. So we want you to uh, listen in. Maybe come hang out with Ronnie and Tom because they're really fun guys and uh, just have a good time. And Jack has an entire page of wisdom here today to hijack your show. No, Talk I'm to me, Jack. Talk. Today. Good morning. He does Bert. it all the How time. Are How are you doing? Good morning, brother Jack Van, Van Beba. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, this one goes along with your post this morning, so I'm not going to hijack it too bad. Okay. All right. Let's hear it. Seniors, the GOP Repub- Republicans seek to destroy the Social Security system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Choked you up, did it? Yeah. Okay. Why? Why? Is the Republican right always choosing to work against the people instead of for the people? The secret is not so secret. The corporations don't want to pay their fair share of Social Security taxes or unemployment compensation or, for that matter, any taxes at all. The GOP Republican politicians are all too happy to cheat seniors out of their Social Security benefits to benefit the corporations as they seek to destroy and undermine all social support for the people, the poor, the working poor, and yes, the middle class too. So seniors get out and vote against the corporate-owned politicians that are attempting to take Social Security benefits from you, the people. Period. You can be voting. I'm voting against them. No, yeah, yeah, I'm not voting. And, you know, I'm actually not voting for anyone. 
I'm voting against certain parties. That's sad. There you it, it, well, this you know, is the way it's been in the past couple of elections. When they ran um, the current Republican candidate and Hillary Clinton, I voted third party because I couldn't vote for either one of them. I thought, oh, my God, this is the worst choices. Then next, we had even more worse choices. And now they're slightly better, but I'm still voting against the Republican Party candidate. I'm going to use my vote to vote against someone, not for someone. Man. Let me tell you something, we guys. Come. We have to reach a point. We have to reach a point where we do the primaries correctly and start voting for someone. It is so important that we start doing these things. But anyway, before we get busy, before we get busy, uh, John Cotter is in the house in the chat and he says, good morning, Egberto and Neil. And you guys, uh, it's Thursday. So you all know which Neil John Cotter is talking about. It's the one and only uh, founder of the Houston Democracy Project, HoustonDemocracyProject.com. El Señor Neil Aquino, welcome to Politics Done Right on Thursday, my brother. Great. How are you doing? Great. Thank you. Thank you, studio. Thank you. John Carter is uh, president of the Humble uh, Democrats and Humble Democrats. You can go um, Humble Democrats. They have a carpool canvas, um, which has been a thing these uh, this year um, on sa Saturdays and Sundays. Um, so, um, to, to eliminate some of the heat and make some of the going between houses easier, uh, someone uh, drives, so they, um, they need a, a driver, humble Democrats. And, um, that has been a, I think a concession to the heat. You've seen multiple democratic clubs <laughs> do their door to door canvassing, um, that way this year, but John also is, um, out frequently on his own, I believe. Um, he's um, uh, canvassing midweek. Um, he, he has the opportunity because um, of his hours to do that. And um, you can actually go to the website of the Harris County Democratic Party, and they have a list of candidates whom um, are actually knocking doors. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pull that. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But there's actually a list of candidates, how many doors they've knocked is listed in van, which is a tool that used to give addresses and uh, the Democratic or Republican scores or proclivities of the voter you're, you're talking to. And uh, Senator uh, Molly Cook has been at the top of uh, um, of the charts. And I actually want to give a shout out because two, two judges um, who've been knocking doors, this is important, and this gets to the themes, Erica Ramirez and Hillary Unger, are two judges who are not even on the ballot. Erica Ramirez and Hillary Unger are two judges not even on the 2024 ballot. They were elected in 2022, but they are on their own knocking doors, uh, telling people to vote Democratic. Um, I think in some part because there are 10 appellate court seats that are up um, on our ballot that cover a 10-county area. They're a huge deal, the 1st and 14th Court of Appeals. Um, but I want to thank the candidates um on the ballot and and molly's in a safe seat the 15 and her her opponent is super far to the right so i just i just want to i just want to thank uh, john and the volunteers and often um you know what's good for the elected officials really isn't the same as what's good for active rank and file democrats who are doing the work and that's why some of those electeds just sit it out um and so thanks to john and thanks to every elected who's Who's invested, and if you know elected official, and this includes the ten city council Democrats who frequently are never involved, um, ask them to get involved. Yeah, uh, jo John Cotter, president of the Humble Democrats. I tell you, he's a hell of a hell of an activist. If you want to know what political involvement is all about, John Cotter, man, he, he really gets Twitter, things uh, done. Humble is on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, Umble, B-L-E, it's where Exxon was founded, I, I believe. And um, uh, you can you can find them on tw on Facebook and Twitter and say, I want to I want to sign up uh, to walk or to drive in, in their canvas. Yeah. Anyway, you were talking about uh, an interesting thing that happened at City Council. Look, we are all for democracy uh, and whichever wh whichever party it doesn't really matter if they do something anti-democratic. 
we're going to call it out. And I think you have a call out today. Let me hear it. Oh, it looks like our brother is currently frozen. Uh, I think you're frozen, my dear, my dear Neil Aquino. So therefore, we got to go on with the program until you re-register and re-come in again. Then we'll be able to see you again. Oh, he's back. He's back. He's back. He's back. Okay, continue. Like I was mentioning before, irrespective of party, if we see something that's occurring that's anti-democratic, we're going to call it out. And I think you have something to call out that you heard at the mayor's uh, one of the council meetings for which you wrote a letter to every single one of them. Let me hear about it. And right. So yesterday, Houston um, needs to hear it. Yes. Yeah, so yesterday, um, I watched city council meetings on Tuesdays. They meet. You can comment at 2 p.m. On Wednesdays, they meet in what they call an agenda session at Wednesday at 9 a.m. So there had been a, just uh, three council members. I'll give a backstory. This is about sidewalks, but in the end, it's not about sidewalks. Uh, three council members, Tiffany Thomas, Carolyn Evans Shabazz, and Ed Pollard, wanted want to and have successfully, it seems at the moment, uh, change our Houston sidewalk ordinance, which was only recently ad- uh, adopted. I, I believe maybe as recently as last year. So if you're a developer and you build a house, uh, you have to put a sidewalk in front of it. Um, if you don't put a sidewalk in front of it, you have to pay a fee. And it seems that some developers don't like that law, right? No surprise. So there are what they call, you know, sidewalks to nowhere. And so you can drive around Houston neighborhoods and you'll see a sidewalk and it doesn't connect to anything. But the point of the program is to get to the point where the sidewalks connect. And in listening to the debate o- over the issue, and I, I've experienced this, um, those sidewalks to nowhere do make a difference. So you're walking um, and that sidewalk where there's a sidewalk gives you a refuge to be off the street. Uh, so it gives you a refuge away from the cars. It gives you the refuge to take a rest for a moment. And so even even a sidewalk to nowhere. So the council members, they, this was brought up three weeks ago, uh, two weeks. Uh, this is the third time it came up, first time two weeks ago, then and then. And there was contentious discussion, but the issue was never brought to a council committee, right? So the process was funky. It was never brought to a council committee and, you know, these things are very passionate discussions. You know, a big focus of, of, of Mayor Whitmire's been debates over bike lanes, road expansions, metro. They know. Those council members knew that this is a contentious issue. No committee hearing. They basically had, you know, people came and testified it on, 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 on Tuesday, those who could be there at 2 o'clock. They contacted their council members, I'm sure, but they could have had a hearing at any point of the of uh, any time of the day or night. At, at any point. So it, the, the, there was a lot of discussion. So it came back again. That's the backdrop. And, and I oppose the changes. It's a little bit outside what the Houston Democracy Project talks about, but I oppose the changes. I want there to be sidewalks. So yesterday they had further discussion and Mayor Whitmire wrote a memo. And the, at the beginning of the day, Mayor Whitmire wrote a memo essentially gutting the fee. He gave the Planning Commission the ability you know, to, to quote unquote, wave, wave the fee, right? If, if, if it looked like there was going to be a sidewalk to nowhere. So in essence, he, 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 he gutted the ordinance and that was a council passed ordinance. So, um, he just did it without a vote of council. That's the gist of what we're talking about here. So here we are, you know, 40 days now with democracy on the ballot and our council is just undoing the law. So I wrote a letter to council members just saying that it was wrong to do it without a vote of council. That, And then the other aspect of this was that the three council members, Pollard, uh, Evan Shabazz, and Tiffany Thomas, used Proposition A. This made it all the worse. So if you remember, Proposition A was overwhelmingly passed by city by Houston city voters last year, just last November, to allow any three council members to introduce something to the council agenda. We have a strong mayor system and, uh, and, and, and only the mayor could introduce items. So now three council members. And if you remember, uh, 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 listeners proposition B, you also passed proposition B that took Houston out of the regional transportation authority. If we didn't get fair funding and they buried that. We're now at 11 months of passage. So we did these things for democracy. We, in our democratic voting city, 
and they're on Proposition B sitting on it, on Proposition A, these three council members used prop to, it to get rid of sidewalks. They, they deny that, but to make it more difficult to build sidewalks. And the result of Proposition A, meant to expand democracy, was that like King George, uh, Mayor Whitmire ar- acted in an arbitrary fashion, just wrote a memo. How is there, he's always talking about public safety. How is there any public safety if one guy can undo the law? So we'll have this law and, 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 or we'll have that law and we can undo it. And then how, when we're fighting Ken Paxton, um, who selectively enforces the law, who enforces only the laws he wants, how, how do we as a city have the ability to tell Ken Paxton what you're doing is, or, or, or any of these authoritarian people, what you're doing is wrong when we're just making up the laws we go along to suit political convenience. And that's exactly what this is. The council members couldn't, it was a contentious discussion. Some of the council members were mad at the three I've talked about for not having a longer process. So the upshot of this is it's been theoretically uh, in December, theoretically, some recommendations are going to come from the planning commission. Theoretically, some recommendations are going to come from the planning commission. But for now, this ordinance has been gutted. They can waive it. You, You know that they'll consistently waive it. There's no provision in the ordinance uh, for waiving it. And I, the last thing I'll say is, Mayor Whitmire, this is, you know, the, the, this is this is a citywide issue. This isn't just, um, uh, it isn't even affluent areas or well-developed areas often don't have sidewalks. There are, there are areas all over town that don't have sidewalks. And, and council member Alcorn wants to, be, wants a sidewalk bond, which would be great. Um, but as we've talked about before there, uh, on the show, there's all sorts of unmet needs in the city. So the upshot here is that we had this ordinance and it's gutted by arbitrary means, p- potentially to suit developers. That's, that's been suggested. And that's the wrong to be doing. Wrong thing to be doing is we face, uh, face a, uh, a, a crisis of democracy. Now, let me just say, I want to come in here to say one thing, because I, I didn't know this. I didn't watch the city council meeting, et cetera. But, you know, here we have the uh, Neil Aquino with the Houston Democracy Project. Yeah, does watch what's going on at city council, which is important. But, you know, we speak a whole lot about uh, the, the most important government to you is the one right under your nose. And many times a uh, government that we don't pay attention to that, whether that be city council, co- commissioner for the city, commissioner's court for the county, uh, your school board, all these are entities or pieces of the government that directly affects you. So whether you're listening here in Houston, whether you're listening in Atlanta, right. whether you're listening no matter what part of the country or the world for that matter, remember, uh, when we talk about lo- the, the interest, why local government is important, it's because the things that directly affect you. Neil is talking about sidewalks today. As you're driving around Houston or, or you're biking around Houston or you're walking around Houston and you get to certain neighborhoods and you don't have sidewalks. My neighborhood, there's no sidewalks at all in my particular right. subdivision, okay? Right. And that, w- what's the reason for that? Again, local laws didn't demand that, which would be great. Over here, we have the kids walking in the streets. It's a danger, right. you know, it, because there's no sidewalk, so people walk in the streets. Uh, and through the neighborhood, the, the street becomes your sidewalk. The ordinance in Houston to have a sidewalk make sense. Acquiescing to developers by saying, Okay, you don't have to pay a fee and you don't have to build the sidewalks. That is, again, something that affects you. So anyway, folks, give us a call. 713-526-5738. 713-526-5738 is the number. I'm taking calls whenever you do call. Uh, Mayor, the other thing. Go ahead. Mayor Whitmire has some funky conceptions of public safety. Um and so it just came out a few weeks ago that there are more traffic deaths in Houston than homicides. Now, that's not a reason to neglect either issue. But the mayor was, you know, the mayor's staff was saying, no, 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 that's that's a false comparison. So Mayor Whitmire is always talking about public safety. He doesn't seem to consider traffic safety public safety. We know people are walking in the street. Um, and he also doesn't seem to consider threats of authoritarianism now just six weeks away in the election. 
matters of public safety. He's been he has a ten million dollar war chest. And other than endorsing Harris walls because he was getting a lot of pressure, he hasn't said a word. So that's a really funky conception of public safety where where traffic safety killing all these people and the threat of mass deportations just months ahead doesn't doesn't seem to animate him very much. Well, we have to be very careful with all of our politicians because, uh, you know, in one of your blogs, I think you uh, that was a couple maybe last week or so. You mentioned that at this point in time, why is it in a city like Houston, our city councils haven't pretty much disavowed uh, authoritarianism, whereas, right. you know, I mean, it, it is, you know, you can't come out here and say, well, I am voting for the guy who says he's going to be an authoritarian. Is that the right word? Authoritarian? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, one can. of my I made a recent post where uh, Councilman Mario Castillo and I'm, I'm I, I could say this about any of them, but council member, a Democrat, Mario Castillo, you know, he's fine, whatever. He's holding a fundraiser October 3rd for an election three years away. He's holding his I keep getting I keep getting emails. Uh, they say it'll be a great time. How much can we sign you up for? And I wrote a blog post, uh, you know, saying uh, council member Castillo. Why don't you contribute 20 percent of your blog of your fundraiser October 3rd to the general campaign, uh, to the 2024 campaign? Or what block walks will you be? So these people just live in a fantasy world. We've got these people campaigning for an election three years away without being overly mindful if if there'll be a democracy in three years. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of these guys, what they're into is take, take, take. You know, I mean, uh, I, and I'm not only talking, I'm talking all these politicians, whether Democratic or, or Republican, they have a tendency right. to just uh, take, take, take. And, you know, uh, folks That's, like, yeah. you know, we got John Cotter runs an organization or whatever. I wonder how many of them make sure that they're fully funded, you know, uh, but they do take, take, take. Anyway, um, folks, uh, 713-526-5738. Uh, I want to take a segue here into Social Security, and then we'll get back to some uh, local issues. But this is a rather important case. A good friend of mine, uh, uh, his name is uh, uh, Lawson, Alex Lawson, uh, found, you know, was doing some research, etc. And he had something to say. The CBO GOP Social Security plan would cut benefits by thousands, not extend solvency. Look. Social security, and this is an article in in Common Dreams that I found that I had to get out there for people to think. I want all of you to think of your vote. Think about the policies that people say they're going to pass. Social security defenders have long argued that former Republican U.S. President Donald Trump's return to the Oval Office could spell disaster for seniors and nonpartisan government analysis, re- uh, uh, rather, t- return to the Oval Office could spell disaster for seniors and a nonpartisan government analysis released Wednesday bolsters their warnings. And listen closely, folks. U.S. House Budget Committee ranking member Brendan Boyle Democrat of Pennsylvania asked the Congressional Budget Office to analyze the impact of raising the full retirement age for Social Security from 67 to 69, as various Republican groups have proposed, including Project 2025 in some form, whether directly or indirectly. This report shows that the retirement age to 69 would slash benefits by an average of, hear this, folks, $3,500 a year. Social Security Works Executive Director, my friend Alex Lawson, told Common Dreams, for seniors and people with disabilities, that means not being able to buy groceries, pay a heating bill, or buy birthday presents for their grandkids. This cruel benefit cut would hit those who claim benefits early, largely people who work on their feet, not those who work in offices, the hardest Lawson noted. Even worse, It is only one of the benefit cuts that Republicans are backing. Their goal is to destroy our Social Security system. As CBO Director Philip L. Swaggle wrote to Boyle, all people affected by such an increase in the FRA, that's that's the, um, the FRA is the full retirement age, affected by the full retirement age, would receive the same monthly benefit for a shorter period of time. Those workers who claim retirement benefits at the same age as they would have claimed under the current law 
would receive a smaller benefit for the same number of years. I want to back out of that and explain something to my listeners. Let me, let me get this to you very clearly. Right now, you can retire at 62. You can take your Social Security at 62. You don't get your full benefits, but you get, you know, I did some calculations. And if you wait till 67, the five years of not getting the amount you get at 62 to recover that would take so much, so many more years of living that let me tell you the dirty little secret. A lot of financial planners would tell you, oh, wait until 67, you'll get more money. Let me tell you. If you do your analysis, and by the way, we don't know how long we're going to live, but when you die, your social security is gone. All right. So I did some, some personal calculations and I figured out I person, somebody in my situation would be ahead collecting social security at 62. When you add the, when you do the analysis of future value of money, plus what you would have collected over the five year, waiting for five years. Again, that calculation is a personal calculation. But the evil within just moving those two years, what it does is it, it takes two years off of a full retirement benefit that you would get. Reduce the amount that you would, that you, because you're working more, that you would ultimately pay in and screw you. It's a tax increase by a different name. It's another wealth transfer by a different name, people. The magical ways in which uh, these guys try to find a way to, to somehow protect those who should be paying more into the social security system is astounding. But let me continue. In a statement responding to the report, Boyle's office highlighted that for workers currently in their 30s and 40s who are subject to full retirement age increase, the average annual benefit cut would be 13% or around 13, 3,500 a year. As the congressman's office pointed out, the CBO also found that though, uh, though increasing the retirement age would reduce spending, it would not create enough savings to change the expected exhaustion date of the Social Security Trust Fund, which is protected to be unable to pay full benefits by the end of fiscal year 2034. Boyle and Senate Budget Committee Chair Sheldon Whitehouse, a Democrat of Rhode Island, have introduced Medicare and Social Security Care Act, which would extend the solvency of both programs by requiring Americans with higher incomes to pay more into Social Security now. Social Security is a sacred promise that after a lifetime of hard work, Americans have earned the right to retire with dignity, Boyle said. The independent nonpartisan report shows just how devastating Republican plans to rip away hard-earned Social Security benefits would be for Americans. Instead of saving Social Security by making the ultra-rich pay their fair share, the GOP is hell-bent on gutting benefits for the middle class, he warned specifically calling out Congressional Republican Study Committee and the Heritage Foundation, which is behind Project 2025. Democrats will never stop fighting to de- keep the promise of Social Security and defend Americans' retirement re- uh, security from Republican attacks. The CVO report comes less than six weeks away from the U.S. general election. Democratic Vice President Kamala Harris is facing Trump in the race for the White House before President Joe Biden left the contest of pass the torch to Harris and the National Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare, National United Committee to Protect Pensions and Social Security Works Political Action Committee were backing him over Trump. All three groups have endorsed Harris. And here's the deal. Um, people think they get ideological with their votes and many times they vote against their own interests, but this time supporting these type of arcane policies is not solely voting against your interest. It's putting the damn country at risk. It's putting not just seniors, but working people at risk. One of the purposes of this program, my brothers and sisters is to inform us on things that aren't quite 
you're not quite informed on on a regular basis. Right now, if you if you watch the news, if you listen to the news, you don't hear a lot about Social Security just in the generalities. You don't hear a lot. They're talking about Trump making a mistake here or Trump doing this or Harris doing this or Harris not telling you exactly what our, our, our plans are. But this is material to you. Your vote matters. And anyone going out there and vote should go and vote with an open with your eyes wide open. And if you think because you don't like somebody's laugh or because you don't like what somebody is doing or because you have an in- intrinsic or intrinsic prejudice against women, against whatever, that you are going to somehow not vote or not vote do in, the, in, in the proper interests, people, this is real life. Patrick, come on in. Hey, good morning. Good morning, uh, sir. I've got a question. I've got a question. Mm-hmm. How does council uh, define uh, sidewalk to nowhere? Neil, the uh, the term. So the term. It's kind of a colloquialism. Um, it's a sidewalk that doesn't connect to another sidewalk. You are you are walking down the street, and let's say there are six houses on the street, and there are only sidewalks in front of two of the houses. Um, and not the other four houses. It's a sidewalk that doesn't connect to another sidewalk. Okay, so Patrick? On, on, the, on the boundary of the development, if those don't connect to something, does that mean that the entire development is a sidewalk that doesn't connect to anything? The entire. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand the question. The there are there are throughout the. Um, I apologize for that. There are throughout. The city in all sorts of neighborhoods, all sorts of regardless of affluence, there are just you know sidewalks that don't connect. Okay, yeah. What, what I'm asking is, can if a ve- developer has a network of sidewalks and they all connect within the neighborhood, but then outside the neighborhood where the the, the boundary of the plot is, um, if those don't connect, do they consider all those a sidewalk to nowhere? Um, you know, I think it's I, it's not it's not a um, it's not a specific engineering uh, term. It's it's kind of a term that's just just developed, and and it's it's so it was it's and it's used a little bit pejoratively. It's used to mock the need for these sidewalks. That that that's what more, I, yeah. Neil, let me get in here because that's what I that's what I when I saw it on the television when they announced it. It's really the, the, the reason they're calling it a sidewalks to nowhere is sort of something that right wing politicians do with propaganda all the times. Right. Right. right by by right. by saying, you know, the, the count, the city is forcing us to, to build a sidewalk to nowhere. What they're trying to say is, look at what regulations is doing. They're forcing us to put a sidewalk here. But right. on the right side, of, there's a house without a sidewalk. And on the left side, there's a house without a sidewalk or an empty lot. That doesn't have a sidewalk. So this is a sidewalk right. to nowhere. Why are you forcing us to build it? Well, you're forcing them to build it for the future, that in the long run, it right. will connect. Right. So and that's, that's case, the whole three issue. Democrats. You know, it's three Democrats. It, it is right. It's, it's kind of a right wing right term or trick of term. It's I mean, they're trying to build a society. They're trying to build a, a, a livable society where you can walk down the, you know, the damn street. Absolutely. So but the reason why I asked is that most of the, the new developments. The uh, first thing that goes in, businesses don't develop until uh, a neighborhood is established. So if a neighborhood is there first and they have a network of sidewalks, those don't go anywhere. And so they they might be setting this up to where uh, eventually they're going to get rid of sidewalks on all all new developments, at least the, the, the legislation for it. Well, that would be that would be a mis- that would be a big mistake. Or again, I, like like Neil was saying before, they they use that term "sidewalk to nowhere" as a pejorative. In other words, to make people believe that they're getting there, that we're asking developers wrongly to put in something that needs to be there, and and also asking them to fund something that needs to be there. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, let me run with the the. I mean. Right. I mean, what their motive, what their motive may be. I mean, this has been a big dispute of Mayor Whitmire's term. Get rid of bike lanes, uh, expand roads, um, not really care about sidewalks. And the mayor will use these demagogic points. He'll say you and the Heights have an eight foot sidewalk while they don't have a sidewalk at all. You know, in Denver Harbor, it's a demagogic. It's it's 
you know what, then fund the sidewalk in, 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 in Denver Harbor. Um, it's, it's not that the Heights has an eight foot sidewalk. And of course, and, and, and he keeps using that example. But of course, there's plenty of areas in the Heights without sidewalks, residential, residential streets. Look, I'm in Kingwood. My neighborhood, like I said, have no sidewalks and it's a hazard. Right. It's a hazard because people walk in the streets or they have to walk in your lawn. I mean, it makes right. no sense. Anything else, Patrick? No, I was just curious. Uh, thank you. I hope, I hope, thank I you, hope I've answered it. I mean, that they seem I mean, I think a vision is that they don't care about sidewalks and don't build sidewalks. Exactly. Harry, come on in. Oh, good morning, Neil. Good morning, Magic Jack. Good morning, morning. Uh, Howard. And good morning, Gilberto Wells. Well, let's just hope that with this election, that they're, you're, we're able to, you're able to vote in people out of that legislator that don't want sidewalks. So Gilberto Wells is neighborhood. They can get the right people in there so they can and get the contracts in place so they can build sidewalks so that kids uh, won't be run over by cars and uh, they can, you know, have a place to walk where they can walk to a library, they can walk uh, to a park and, and it'd be safe because that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, two things I wanted, uh, other things I wanted to talk about. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, the social security. Well, I, I, I told this story before uh, about, uh, I saw this years ago, Ted Koppel's night line, and uh, this old man, uh, he's, he uh, called him, well, he was uh, talking about, wait a minute, to a young guy who didn't want to pay into the Social Security system. So it seems to me these Republicans, uh, as Huberto eloquently put, they want to destroy Social Security, and neoliberals do too. They don't want the rich to pay their fair share. They want the wait a minute to die off. doesn't matter if you're a independent Republican or, uh, or, or a Democrat, and they don't want any new wait a minute. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, what I heard on Democracy Now! And I'm very concerned about this. We, as Dr. John and Mike talked on their show, you talked yesterday, Kamala Harris has a Middle East problem with Hezbollah and Hamas and all that because they're, because uh, that war has expanded into Hezbollah and uh, into Lebanon, I should say. With, uh, with, against Hezbollah and Israel. And what uh, I'm concerned about is Dr. Jill Stein in these battleground states has 40% and is leading in these battleground states. And her running mate was saying uh, that she, it was with her that, look, the, the Muslim vote is gone. And I know Tag, who regularly calls in here, uh, he said there's certain counties, I think he said yesterday, that will still vote Democrat. But uh, it is concerning that there are uh, in Michigan and in Georgia and some of these other uh, swing states that uh, if they don't call for a permanent ceasefire or an arms embargo, as uh, Amy, when she was interviewing these people, and the Muslim vote is gone and they need those Muslims to vote. Kabbalah needs those people to vote for her because if they vote for Joe Stein, that's, that's going to hurt Harris because I believe Trump is polling at 18 percent in those uh, swing states. Uh, with Muslim voters and Kabbalists uh, polling at 12 percent, and it went from 86 percent four years ago when uh, 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 Joe Biden proposed to get rid of that ban, that stupid ban that Trump had in place, a ban on all Muslims. So, you know, Kabbalists needs to meet with Dr. Joe Stein, and, you know, that's very concerning because if she doesn't win those swing states, as we know, she's not going to be president. So okay, like let me let, let me an, let me answer that. I want to answer a few things, okay? And I want to tell the entire audience um, first of all, um, you know how I speak out against what the genocide that's occurring in in uh, in Gaza, the genocide that is starting to occur in uh, in where where uh, the I eighty the yeah, ADF is, is really destroying a whole lot of uh, buildings, killing innocent people in Lebanon. I've spoken out against that. Uh, Kamala Harris, uh, the, I said the, uh, I'm going to put it bluntly, based on the demagoguery that occurs in the United States, based on the effectiveness of APAC, which is the, um, the that the, it, which is that political arm, I call, of the Israeli government interfering in American politics. But they got rid of two of our um, 
progressive heroes. Based on the effectiveness of APAC and the lack of time that we have, because again, if Harris goes ahead and makes the wrong move and says the wrong thing with Israel, APAC is going to, these are statements of fact. APAC is going to come in. Right. And because in general, our population is a low information population, before one gets a chance to correct what the, the misinformation that's going to be put out by APAC, you lose an election. So what I'm telling right. people out there is, is we all need to grow up, especially progressives who are thinking people need to grow up. And, and some people get, off get offended when I say that. But if you think, if you're an Arab American and you say, I'm going to hold, I'm going to hold Kamala responsible for X, Y, Z, not saying X, Y, Z about Israel. And whether you vote for, uh, you don't vote at all, or you vote for Stein or you vote for somebody else. And that opens the door for Trump to come in. And if you think you're because you feel better that you didn't support somebody that was 100 percent aligned with you, you didn't support them, that you're that that you're doing. So, the only person you're damaging really is yourself. The only persons you're damaged. I, I tell you something when I, I uh, uh, somebody called me and said, I said, you know, oh, my sister in an interview I did with my own sister who is uh, a MAGA supporter. I, I, okay. I, I point, I pointed out, I said this, neither Kamala Harris, nor Donald Trump, nor Stein, nor any one of these guys care personally about you. So when all of them lose or win, their lives go on. Kamala will still be rich. Trump will still be in trouble and rich. Stein will still be yeah. rich because all we have run is, is a bunch of rich people. Okay. Right. And while you, what your vote can materially affect your life, none of those rich people that are running, the only person's life that gets affected is Donald Trump because if he doesn't win, he's going to jail. So uh, to right. all those that are listening to me right now, I, I, I am not very patient. I, well, I am patient by design. Uh, my radio host by design, but I'm going to tell you something you are doing. If you say, ah, I'm not going to vote for Kamala just because do you think Kamala really, I mean, yes, she wants to be president, but do you think it's going to materially affect her more than it's going to materially affect you? Hell no. Let me, um, let me go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Neil. Let me tell you, let me say, Berto, uh, this is a Reuters This story is dated yesterday from the news agency Reuters. Uh, U.S. Muslim advocacy group M-Gage, that's E-M-G-A-G-E, which I've heard of, and they, they do have at least some operation here. U.S. They advocacy, support her. Uh, M-Gage action on Wednesday endorsed Democratic presidential candidate Harris despite ongoing concern over the war of Gaza, saying President Trump posed a greater danger with his promise to reinstate travel restrictions in flood majority Muslim countries. So you, um, that, that's a leading uh, uh, Muslim uh, advocacy group and uh, they made that decision and while we do not agree with all of harris's policies particularly on the war of gaza we are approaching this election with both pragmatism and conviction there you go that's uh, that's an arab american group uh, uh, our uh, paul fleming who's in the chat right now he actually brought that to my attention yesterday so paul thank you for doing that welcome aboard paul fleming eric hayes and john cotter in the chat let's go to peter come on in peter Good morning, Egberto. It's so nice to be with y'all. And and I just had a, a question or a comment, see what's your thought on this concern I'm having. As you know, I'm the uh, Democratic nominee for U.S. House, Texas District 2. And uh, being a candidate, I have a chance to talk to a lot of the constituents. And I had a concern because some gentleman just got very angry when I went just to talk to him about about illegal aliens. Just, that was his, his main concern. And then also I hear a lot of rhetoric about I'm a socialist. I'm I'm a this. I'm a that. I'm a Marxist. However, you know, I'm an honorable man. I'm I've served in the public sector for my entire career, and so when these people make uh, these broad, you know, broad based uh, conclusions that I'm somehow I support illegal aliens, that somehow I'm a Marxist, I'm a socialist, 
So what would be my rebuttal to them? And that's what I'm, that's what I'd like to know. Let me tell you, I, I've, I've got the answer for you, brother. I've got the answer for you. First of all, I, I know who you are, Peter, and you're a prof- a teacher, I think in a high school or middle school. What's, what do you teach? That's right. Ninth grade English, sir. <laughs> there you go. Let me tell you something. Yeah. First of all, I want to, I, I want to honor you as a teacher. I think the teaching is the most honorable profession bar none. Okay. I would go ahead and I would not be, I, I would show no animosity towards this person at all. I would just tell this guy, let me tell you something, my brother. Number one, I love all my fellow Americans, every single one of them, whether Republican or Democrat. And while you, uh, you hate what you think of me, I guarantee you that the things that I want for my family are the same things you want for your family. Would you be interested in discussing that? And start it that way. If he still goes bellicose or belligerent, then he has no interest in really, uh, he, just, he just wants to talk. So kindly tell him, nice meeting you, and move on. But what I'm saying is don't run from the conversation. Try to have that conversation by letting him know that my interests, I can almost guarantee you, are mostly symmetrical with yours. And that usually put people at a pause. Let's start talking about what you want. Don't tell him what you want. Ask him what he wants and let him enumerate them what you want. And then you take and this it from is the there. Candidate running against Crenshaw, correct? Yeah. That's yeah, he's running against Crenshaw. But I, my, my phones are filled, so I'm going to have to move on, Peter. But Peter, I hope Peter, we can Thank also you, talk man. offline at any time. But I got to move on. But Peter, good luck on yeah. the CD two, and, and thank you for going out there and still engaging the population. And most importantly, before politics, thank you so kindly for being a teacher, brother. <laughs> you can count on me. Thanks, guys. You have, have a great day. one. All right, let's go to Jacobo. Hey, Jacob, come on in, my brother. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't know if Peter ready, man. It's tough. This this it's tough in them streets and in them politics. Now, with Kamala, man, I can't. Kamala, I think she made the, the wrong choice of vice president because he, he him or whatever. He don't even seem like he had no value. He's not adding any value. And actually, he is. No, 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 Jacob. Oh, I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Go ahead. Continue, Jacob. Sorry. Yeah. I think if she would have gotten out because she didn't choose the governor of Pennsylvania. He's young. He got, you know, the thing is what separated him. He is Jewish. He is Jewish. But the thing is, he was like for pro, pro uh, choice vouchers to go to schools. And stuff. I think that was a that was a part of the issue, and I think also she thought she would lose the airport, but she losing it anyway. So if she would have added him to the ticket, I think it would have gave her a, a better chance to win because he's he's young, he's you know what I mean. He the, the octave of him is better than Welch, and and Welch who who is he bringing? What is he? What is he? She got Minnesota. So what what kind of value did he add to the ticket for her? All right, let me answer that now because I, 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 I disagree with you. And let me tell you why I disagree with you. I love Walls. And all of us progressives, we were hoping we didn't want Shapiro. Now, let me, let me give you the, the first, the carnal part about our country. If we had brought Shapiro in, and, and I know a lot of people are not going to want to hear this, but it, this is a reality. Uh, Donald Trump, the racist that he is, would have said, I told you that the country is being taken over by those others. Now we have a, 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 a black Indian president and a Jewish vice president. Where is WASP? You don't get the dynamics no. of the country. That is the first thing they would have said. We have a Jew, black Indian running this executive. That is not, it, look, you are not a racist and most of the people that are listening to my show, great people, but my God, would that be a great commercial in, the, in, in, in a lot of places for uh, it, that, oh my God, Jew, black, Indian, oh my God. So that's the first thing. Now, what I love about Walls is Walls is a genuine guy. And not only is Walls a genuine guy, the folksy guy that he is, he, he makes, he brings a lot of comfort to the ticket. 
And I've seen that in Michigan. I've seen that in Wisconsin. I've seen that in Georgia. I love the guy. So that's my uh, opinion on that one, um, uh, brother, brother Jacob. But I got to move on, brother Jacob, to Jake. Come on in, Jake. Yes, I'm. Did I lose you? Yeah, you're here, Jake. Okay, thank you. Uh, back to two earlier topics very quickly, sidewalks and Social Security. Uh, I bought this house in this neighborhood in 1987, and one mm -hmm. of the selling points for me was it was a small neighborhood, about 215 houses, no sidewalks, people walking in the streets, not a lot of traffic. I've been living here since 1987. That's 37 years. No accidents that I know of other than I lost one dog. Sidewalk wouldn't have saved that dog because he ran into the street. Um, but nobody's been run over in this neighborhood. People walk in the street. Do you live, do you very live in the city limits? Do you live in the city limits, sir? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I do. Okay. Well, okay. Jake, thank you very much, my brother. I, I look. I am. I, I, I like sidewalks, but you know, sometimes again, th that's a personal preference. You know, I think sidewalks are safer. Go ahead, Neil. You know, very quick. quickly to Jake's point. Very quickly, the you know that the, they said that people don't know. You know that not every homeowner and everyone wants sidewalks. Um, it, it's 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 not my vision of a city. There are perfectly good, excellent people who who don't want them. That's that's truthful. All right, let's go to uh, let's go to Johnny. Come on in, Johnny. I liked your advice that you gave to candidate Peter. It's so simple, but genius at the same time. My one question is, Crenshaw, is he the guy with the eye patch who jumped out of the back of a military yes. airplane for a... a, a yes, that, that's Crenshaw. Yeah. So, uh, so if I were Peter, I would point out in my campaigns, imagine, if you will, dear voter, Barack Obama or Tim Waltz dressed up with an eye patch, jumping out of the back of an airplane. Who is he talking to? He's talking to... 12-year-olds who will be a voting age in six years. He's not acting like an adult. He's no more adult than Donald Trump. I rest my case. Thank you, my brother. Let, let's go to, let's go to uh, Brian. Uh, by the way, Nancy Salayabatoda gave an interesting point, and she says people in wheelchairs need sidewalks. So again, right. it's a thing about, yeah, you think about people, and you think about not just it's 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 a society thing. Thank you for that one, Nancy. All right, let's go to Brian. Let's go to Brian. Okay. Well, first off, this is the first time I've ever complained to another caller. Hey, Johnny, uh, Crenshaw was a U.S. Navy SEAL. Uh, he fought against terrorism. You need to look something up before you uh, insult someone. Now, the other thing is, you keep calling uh, Donald Trump a racist. Why don't you watch some of the interviews with, uh, like, say, Mike Tyson, Shaquille O'Neal? Uh, uh, maybe uh, Don King. Why don't you find out if he's a racist through their eyes? Why, no why problem. Don't you do that I, before you keep Trump a racist? I, I, let me tell you, I don't have to do that at all. I just have to listen to his words. You don't want I to. don't have to. I, no, sir. To. Brother, I don't, sir. I don't have to. I just listen to what he does. I mean, I watch what he does. Okay. I don't care that, you know, that is like a white, a white friend of mine saying, I have black friends. Okay. That doesn't say anything. That is like somebody says, I'm married to a black woman, but I'm not big. And that makes me not racist. I think that is a fundamental issue. Race. When I was a sexist, I was married to a woman. When I was a sexist, I had a sister. When I was a sexist, I had all these things. Having interactions with somebody of some other ethnicity or gender doesn't make you not that pejorative. I had to teach myself not to be a sexist. Donald Trump is a racist. Thank you, Brian. I got to go to Peter. Come on in, Peter. Peter, line six, Peter. All right, let's go to Jake, Peter. line three. Okay, Peter, real quick. You got 30 seconds. Patrick? Oh, Patrick. Come on in, Patrick. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was confused. Uh, uh, as far as Brian, Brian goes, um, there's numerous photographs of, of Trump uh, allegedly uh, holding white power signs with his fingers. Um, also, when he was asked to uh, uh, distance himself from uh, white power uh, uh, known individuals, he refused to. Um, but that's not why I called. As far as Tim Walls not adding anything to the ticket, I, I think that's probably one of the strangest things I've heard. That was her signaling that she's in interested in helping common people. Um, he championed bills trying to stop corruption in uh, Congress as far as insider trading yep. goes. Um, he's not profiting. Off, he's not profiting off his uh, position. He's one of the only people in in Congress that can say that. 
Um, he did his <laughs> Everything he's done for his state has improved. His Peter, I, I, I'm, I'm pressed for time. Peter, I'm out of time. I'm out of time. But guess what? You're absolutely right. Look up <laughs> what Walls has done in Minnesota. Okay, one more. Jake, you got exactly 15 seconds. Jake, 15 seconds. I got to go. I, I, here, I had two topics. second topic was Social Security. I did what you were talking about earlier. I uh, went into Social Security at 62 because I did the graph. And uh, assuming that the, the uh, payouts were going to be constant, of course, you have no control of that. I saw where my lines intersected a little bit after 83 years of age. Well, I'm right. 18, but I feel like I made the right decision. You did. That me. You did. Yeah, I, I so. calculated it. You did, Jake. You're a genius. Jake, I got to go to the studio. But thank you, brother, for right. uh, uh, you know letting the rest of the people know that. Come on in, studio. Well, nothing for me, Jack. What you got? You know, Real our quick, retirement Jack. Age, our retirement age is 69 means they want you to die before they'll pay you. Thank you, Jack. You nailed it. You nailed it. Neil, tell us about Houston Democracy Project and how people can get to you, brother. Houston Democracy Project, HoustonDemocracyProject.com, HoustonDemocracyProject.com. I've got a daily blog. Please check it out, share it around, and support the project. Thank you so kindly, Neil, for being here on Thursday. I want to tell all the callers, love you all. Listeners, love you all. Guys, I got to get out of here. Uh, politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter. Politicsdoneright.com slash newsletter. You can find the entire show on videos. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. And you guys know how I end this baby. I am what? Out! Support for this show, Politics Done Right, comes from politicsdoneright.com, publishers of how to Make America Utopia, Take Away the Economy from Those Who Rigged It, As I See It, Class Warfare, The Only Resort to Right-Wing Doom, It's Worth It, How to Talk to Your Right-Wing Relatives, Friends, and Neighbors, and Other Books Written by Egberto Willis. Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. <laughs>